Chapter One of The Dude Wrangler by Caroline Lockhart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One The Girl from Wyoming. Conscious that something had disturbed him, Wally McPherson raised himself on his elbow in bed to listen. For a full minute, he heard nothing unusual. The Atlantic breaking against the seawall at the foot of the sloping lawn of the Colonial, the clock striking the hour in the tower of the courthouse, and the ripping, tearing, slashing noises like those of a sash and blind factory produced through the long, thin nose of old Mr. Penrose two doors down the hotel corridor, all sounds to which he was too accustomed to be awakened by them. While Wally remained in this posture conjecturing, the door between the room next to him and that of Mr. Penrose was struck smartly several times, and with a vigor to denote that there was temper behind the blows which fell upon it. He had not known that the room was occupied, being considered undesirable on account of the audible slumbers of the old gentleman. It was often vacant. The raps finally awakened even Mr. Penrose, who demanded sharply, "'What are you doing?' "'Hammering with the heel of my slipper,' a feminine voice answered. "'What do you want?' "'A chance to sleep.' "'Who's stopping you?' Cravatly. Your snoring indignation gave an edge to the accusation. You're impertinent. You're a nuisance, the voice retorted. Wally covered his mouth with his hand and hunched his shoulders. There was a moment's silence while Mr. Penrose seemed to be thinking of a suitable answer. Then, it's my privilege to snore if I want to. This is my room. I pay for it. Then this side of the door is mine, and I can pound on it for the same reason. Mr. Penrose sneered in the darkness. I suppose you're some sour old maid. You sound like it. And no doubt you're a Methuselah with dyspepsia. Wally smote the pillow gleefully. Old Mr. Penrose's collection of bottles and boxes and tablets for indigestion were a byword. "'We will see about this in the morning,' said Mr. Penrose, significantly. "'I have been coming to this hotel for twenty-eight years.' "'It's nothing to boast of,' the voice interrupted. "'I shouldn't, if I had so little originality.' Mr. Penrose seeming to realize that the woman would have the last word if the dialogue lasted until morning, ended it with a loud snort of derision. He was so wrought up by the controversy that he was unable to compose himself immediately, but lay awake for an hour framing a speech for Mr. Cohn, the proprietor, which was in the nature of an ultimatum. Either the woman must move, or he would but the latter he considered a remote possibility, since he realized fully that a multi-millionaire, socially well-connected, is an asset which no hotel will dispense with lightly. The frequency with which Mr. Penrose had presumed upon this knowledge had much to do with Wally's delight as he had listened to the encounter. Dropping back upon his pillow, the young man mildly wondered about the woman next door to him. She must have come in on the evening train while he was at the moving pictures, and retired immediately. Very likely she was, as Mr. Penrose asserted, some acrimonious spinster. But, at any rate, she had temporarily silenced the rich old tyrant of whom all the hotel stood in awe. A second time, the ripping sound of yard after yard of calico being viciously torn broke the night's stillness, and, grinning, Wally waited to hear what the woman next door was going to do about it. 
but only a stranger would have hoped to do anything about it since to prevent mr penrose from snoring was a task only a little less hopeless than that of stopping the roar of the ocean guess whom it annoyed had either to move or get used to it sometimes they did the one and sometimes the other but always mr penrose who was the subject of a hundred complaints a summer snored on victoriously the woman next door of course could not know this so no doubt she had a mistaken notion that she might either break the old gentleman of his habit or have him banished to an isolated quarter wallie had not long to wait for shortly after mr penrose started again the tattoo on the door was repeated in response to a snarl that might have come from a menagerie she advised him curtly you're at it again another angry colloquy followed and once more mr penrose was forced to subside for the want of an adequate answer all the rest of the night the battle continued at intervals and by morning not only wallie but the entire corridor was interested in the occupant of the room adjoining his wallie was in the office when the door of the elevator opened with a clang and mr penrose sprang out of it like a starved lion about to hurl himself upon a christian martyr while his jaws did not drip saliva the thin nostrils of his bothersome nose quivered with eagerness and anger i've been coming here for twenty-eight years haven't i he demanded twenty-eight this summer mr cone replied soothingly in that time i never have put in such a night as last night dear me the proprietor seemed genuinely disturbed by the information i could not sleep i have not closed my eyes for the battering on my door of the female in the room adjoining you astonish me let me see mr cone whirled the register around and looked at it he read aloud helene spensley prouty wyoming mr cone lowered his voice discreetly what was her explanation she accused me of snoring declared mr penrose furiously i heard the clock strike every hour until morning not a wink have i slept not a wink mr cone we can arrange this satisfactorily mr penrose mr cone smiled conciliatingly i have no doubt that miss er spensley will gladly change her room if i ask her i shall place one equally good at her disposal ah i presume this is she let me introduce you although he would not admit it mr penrose was quite as astonished as wallie at the appearance of the person who stepped from the elevator and walked to the desk briskly she was young and good-looking and wore suitable clothes that fitted her also while not aggressive she had a self-reliant manner which proclaimed the fact that she was accustomed to looking after her own interests while she was as far removed as possible from the person mr penrose had expected to see still she was the female who had sassed him as he had not been sassed since he could remember and he eyed her belligerently as he curtly acknowledged the introduction mr penrose one of our oldest guests in point of residence tells me that you have had some little mm, difference began mr cone affably i had a hellish night mr penrose interrupted savagely i hope never to put in such another i join you in that replied miss spensley calmly i've never heard anyone snore so horribly i'd know your snore among a thousand never mind we can adjust this matter amicably i will change your room to-day miss spensley mr cone interposed hastily 
it hasn't quite the view but the furnishings are more luxurious but i don't want to change miss spensley coolly replied it suits me perfectly i came for quiet and i can't stand that hammering declared mr penrose glaring at her so did i my nerves and your snoring bothers me but perhaps with aggravating sweetness i can break you of the habit i wouldn't lose another night's sleep for a thousand dollars it will be cheaper to change your room for i don't mean to change mine the millionaire turned to the proprietor either this person goes or i do that's my ultimatum i will not be bullied in any such fashion and i can't very well be put out forcibly can i and miss spensley smiled at both of them mr cone looked from one to the other helplessly then mr penrose retorted i shall leave immediately mr cone dramatically the room i have occupied for twenty-eight summers is at your disposal his voice rose in a crescendo movement so that even in the furthermost corner of the dining room they heard it i have a peach orchard down in delaware and i shall go there where i can snore as much as i damn please and don't you forget it mr cone his mouth open and hands hanging looked after him as he stamped away too astonished to protest. End of chapter one.